Cavalry has arrived! What's up, Minute Nerds? The Clone Wars is back. My first viewing of the episode was great, and Clone Wars fans know this Bad Batch arc from watching the unfinished episodes years ago, but it was still great to see everything finalized. One of the most impressive things was the animation and action, which really matched the firepower of Bad Batch. We'll do a full breakdown of the unique arms, armor, and tactics of Clone Force 99, as there are a ton of blink and you'll miss it details in these action scenes. But first I want to thank this video's sponsor, the Star Wars Card Trader app by Topps. With the Clone Wars Season 7 coming back, it's a great time to jump in, because they just rolled out some limited edition cards like the Clone Wars Signature Series, and there's a ton of great Clone Wars era cards. Having just started, I was able to get a bunch of packs in a couple minutes, and got cards from all kinds of eras in different shows and movies. You can buy crystals to get packs quicker, but what's great is that with things like lock-on, daily awards, and cargo drops, you can add to your collection throughout the day. You can see in my collection I already have some cool ship cards, some of my favorite droids, and a nice detailed card of Big Palpy himself. The beauty of it being digital cards is that you're able to trade with people across the world. When you get duplicates or cards you're just not that crazy about, you can trade them to others. Currently, I'm trading all of these cards for a single vintage Tarkin card. If you want to start collecting and trading with me, just search MetaNerds in the app. It's free to download, so go sign up and start building your collection by clicking on the link in the description. But let's go back to Anaxis, where the most infamous and effective clone unit is arriving. I've heard mixed things about these guys. They have a 100% success rate. Towards the end of the war, the Kaminoans' goal of eugenic perfection transitions into more deliberate mutation. Something that we talk about in our extensive Clone Wars documentary if you want to check that out. And I do have to pause and respect 99, the defective clone reject that died a true hero of the Republic, and whom these mutated clones are named after. Each of them having highly specialized biological traits that are paired with specialized weaponry. And keep in mind that what makes them so impressive is that they all synergize. Whether operating in fully offensive tactics like Shockwave, or when being more stealthy. So let's start with the leader, Hunter. The cloners genetically modified him to have a greater range of hearing, more visual acuity, and an incredibly sensitive olfactory system that allowed him to sniff out droids. Smelling a machine might sound odd at first, but the materials, shielding interacting with the atmosphere, Tabana gas variants, and types of fuel used for their ships and vehicles would all have distinct smells, and worked in concert with his ability to detect strong fluctuations in electromagnetic emissions across many kilometers. Defense droids buried underground, or the location of hidden shield generators, would all be detectable via Hunter's genetic modification. He was also incredibly agile and trained for stealth, which led to him carrying a single DC-17 blaster pistol and vibroblade, while also picking up droid blasters along the way. This dual pistol style is used famously by Rex, but the quick and efficient movements with the blade is really impressive in the hands of Hunter. He can even take out dwarf spiders with ease, or disable numerous T-series tactical droids with a few moves deliberately not destroying their head casing, which can be used later by Republic Intel. And all these weapons were quick to present, with the vibroblades storing away in his wrist comm system. Each member of Bad Batch has these devices that differ from your standard clone trooper, but the most impressive technology is in the hands of the aptly named Tech. His genetic modifications increased his critical thinking, memory, and visual spatial awareness at the expense of aggression and physical prowess. He's incredibly focused on his tasks. We see that after battles, he goes right to calibrating his wrist comms or hopping on the CIS computer systems, while the other clones are often still celebrating. While normal clones needed a balance of aggression and intellect, Tech was able to take the intelligence of the clone template to new limits, and like his brothers, was perfectly paired with his equipment. His armor is heavily modified from that of a scout trooper, with the addition of several antenna on the helmet and backpack that are pouring information into this data pad. The helmet also has these noise amplifiers, the Leia Bun-like attachments that we've seen on the clone operators of the stealth ship, and during the second Battle of Geonosis. With all this info going to the visor, it gives him an augmented reality view of the battlefront. Through this genetically gifted mind in the computer system, he is able to provide ideal trajectory for weaponry, like we see with the ion grenades. He would also carry dual DC-17s, but would be the one to duck out of combat to provide data to the more effective killers. But that's not to say he couldn't shoot, as we see him dropping plenty of clankers when the time is right. It should also be noted that when moving through fire, Tech always stays well protected in the middle of the squad. If you rewatch this episode, you'll see that the creators really paid attention to these small details. It's just cool to see this being kept consistent throughout. He also has many pouches full of hardware for every occasion, allowing him to slice into doors and computer systems or read other data cards. And we see that when slicing code, he can set up his data pad to be providing a constant scan of the surroundings by picking up on the droid's EM signature. Now the closest to Tech would be Crosshair, the team's sniper. 
Fittingly, we see that his helmet also has an extra antenna, and a similar augmented reality visor. With tech providing invaluable data on CIS troop locations, and some computerized targeting assistance, he could get headshots from 10 clicks or about 6 miles away. The rifle he used was a 773 Fire Puncher, known for incredible accuracy, but also gets its name from the wide beam burning mode that could melt through multiple targets at once. More than a decade later, this same Mersan munitions creation would be a favorite of criminal organizations, seen in the hands of the thugs under the employ of Vizago and As Morgan. Again, with the incredible detail here, if you look close, you can see that the normal helmet visor is cut out on the upper right edge to allow better aiming through the scope. His genetic modifications made him incredibly well coordinated and unmoved by battlefront stress or muscle fatigue, all allowing him to stay steady and rapidly pick off battle droids. Ironically, this kind of affect and mechanical efficiency is normally only seen in droids. His backpack likely has supplies and ammo like the others, but it's cool to see its weapon rack system. But perhaps when we see the drop-down visor showing the CIS vehicle identification outline, it is also displaying the access code to hijack it. Having the droids relay a code to their vehicles seems like a good way to access them, so this may be able to intercept or decipher the code used by these B1s. Because once he enters, he does type something in. But from the techie and the far-off sniper, we gotta talk about the powerful brute. Wrecker was genetically modified for sheer power. He is a bit taller and a whole lot wider, being modified to grow denser bones and pack on more muscle. His strength is far superior to your standard clone and even many droids, allowing him to lift up an entire LAAT gunship by himself. And later he even kicks open a blast door, much to Tech's annoyance. His weapon of choice is the Republic Commando Rifle, aka the DC-17M Interchangeable Weapon System. In Legends, this weapon was modular and could be changed into a sniper or grenade launcher, the latter really being something I could see Wrecker using. He also has a Vibro Weapon sidearm, but it's much larger than your average blade, perhaps best described as a Vibro Machete. His power made things like the Shockwave Maneuver possible, which really shows off how this bad batch of clones all harmonize perfectly, earning them the envious 100% success rate likely the only clone unit that could say that. As for behind the scenes facts, their armor is inspired by the clone commandos, and with their Battlefront 2 edition, the amazing mod community has made some skins of Bad Batch that look awesome. I thought it funny that this production note shows that Wrecker's DC-17 was scaled up by 15%, I'm thinking because it would be comically small on his gargantuan frame. George Lucas wanted Bad Batch to be a sort of clone version of the Dirty Dozen, and Filoni says that he based Wrecker on the Hulk, Crosshair was inspired by Clint Eastwood, with Toothpick instead of Iconic Cigar. And he says that Hunter was based on Billy Soul from the Predator movie, but he also gives off some Rambo vibes. I guess Tech is just your generic tech guy. I imagine there will be a ton of cool little details in the next couple episodes of this Bad Batch arc, but hopefully this gave you some nice background knowledge for the next ones, and some things to catch when re-watching this episode. Expect a ton of new Clone Wars content and all kinds of other cool stuff coming soon. If you want to connect with us on social media, Find ways that you can support this channel for free, or check out our Patreon and PayPal. Be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, the season has only just begun, and the Force will be with you, always.